When I sit down in the village of Ginkelich with Chester and Mary Moore, they're in their 70s. And I, we went there, they, they got the first road into that village, was it 10 years ago? Well, 15 years ago now. Um, otherwise, the only way in there was by boat or seaplane. Uh, but the people have been living continuously in that location for over 9,000 years. And they've been dealing with the food supply available to them for 9,000 years, which means they've been studying this. Their, their cultural experience with this you know, is hundreds of times what my academic experience is with this. And so we went to ask them you know, not to show us their encyclopedia of, of their culture. We just said, simple question, what did your grandparents eat when you were children? What, what, was the, what were the preferred food, foods, foods of your, your grandparents? And it took about three minutes for them to sit there with kind of wide-eyed amazement before they kind of realized that we really meant to ask them that. Because every, all the other guys with blue eyes like me would come in there and told them, oh, that fat that you eat, that's terrible stuff. You should eat a high-carb, low-fat diet. But when we didn't tell them to start preaching, and when we indicated we were willing to at least listen a little bit, um, we learned quite a bit, and that's when they brought out that amazing panoply of food um, uh, to, to explain to us what it was and what they ate. So I'm, uh, I don't, don't want to make a big deal. I like to learn from people like that. Um, so my topic now is I want to talk about, um, kind of argue for, uh, from what I kind of gleaned as aboriginal experience, what the optimum diet should look like, and I've, I've come to the conclusion, I'll just give you my bottom line and you can go out in the hall and do something else, and that's basically a high fat, moderate protein, low carb diet. And one of the problems I have when I try to talk about low carb diets to professional colleagues and even lay people is, you know, all those high protein diets, right? And I said, well actually no, it's not high protein. Oh yeah, but you know, Dr. Atkins said it was a high protein diet. There are all these paleo people out there who tell you you should eat a high protein diet. Um, and so I want to try to I don't want to be divisive, but I do want to try to f explain a difference between what is right now mostly you know, the, the common concept of a paleo diet versus the high fat, low carb diet. Now, when I talk to paleo advocates and I read what they uh, write about it, um, I find something different than what I get from Aboriginal, moder what I call modern Aboriginal people. So the Paleolithic period ended 15,000 years ago. That was before there were any agricultural foods by any cultures. So the Paleo people say, well, that's, that was the end of the time in which we humans learned to eat you know, the diet that we'd, we'd evolved on over two, over two million years. Um, Unfortunately, 15,000 years ago, those people, other than painting remarkable paintings on cave walls and, and in uh, uh, other locations, they, never, they didn't write down what they ate. So what we know about their diet is based on archaeology, and that means basically we examine their garbage. Um, and you, know, it, you can find some really elegant things by looking at pollens and carbon dating and stuff like that. And most, based on that, most paleo proponents described as being somewhere between 20 and 40 percent protein between 20 and 40 percent non-grain carbs, and at most about 50 percent fat. And when I talk to some of the paleo advocates, they say, oh, you, should, you shouldn't eat more fat than that because the fat's bad for you. I say, really? Okay. But they get to that by the presumptions based on what they find on the, on the floor of caves and in garbage dumps and things like that. Now, um, I want to use a term here, eucaloric, which means a eucaloric diet is a when you're eating a diet where the calories you are eating maintains your weight. We won't talk about calories in, calories out. But if you are weight stable for years, then you've, you've reached some kind of metabolic balance. And that's a eucaloric intake. In other words, there's non-weight loss involved. If you eat 20% or more of your calories as carbohydrate, when you're meeting your daily ba energy balance needs, you will not be in nutritional ketosis, defined, as I mentioned this morning, the above 0.5 millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate. And in addition, even if you don't eat visible carbs, if you eat more than 30% of your calories as protein, because protein also stimulates insulin to some degree, that suppresses nutritional ketosis. So if you're eating a diet that's some combination of 20 to 40% protein and 20 to 40% non-grain carbs, you are by definition not in nutritional ketosis. It is low, relatively low carb, 
but we're not dealing with the metabolic properties of beta-hydroxybutyrate, both in terms of its ability to feed your brain, take your brain off of glucose, and have it supply the central nervous system without having to have much dietary carbs. And you don't get that drug-like effect of, of turning off the silencing genes, which allows you to be better protected against oxidative stress, which is probably why the Heide woman that Dr. Um, uh, Wartman showed you looked much younger than her stated age. Um, the other really intriguing thing is we humans have been living with dogs for a long time. We're still figuring out how long ago it was that we domesticated canine uh, uh, lupus to become canine familiaris to become dogs. But we do know from Aboriginal people who live with dogs and, and e eating their traditional diet that when they harvested animals to feed themselves and their dogs, the humans kept the fat for themselves and they fed the lean to their dogs. Your dog can thrive on 50% of its calories coming from protein. But if you try to eat, to be eucaloric on a diet that's 50% protein, it will make you sick. And the Aboriginal people understood this, and so when they cut up an animal and divided it up between themselves and the dogs, they got the fat, the dogs got the lean. When you look at what's on the floor of the cave, based on garbage dump science, pardon me, that's not vitriolic, that's descriptive, you don't know what they ate and what they fed their dogs. And so maybe the dogs were eating 50% protein, and the humans were eating 20% protein. And that's why you see that, that intake. So we really don't know what the Paleolithic people ate because they didn't keep diet records, they didn't have food pyramids, whatever. Okay. Um, and I've also been told by many paleo proponents that you have to have 20% of your energy, at least from carbohydrate, to feed your brain. But they say, you know, the brain burns 600 calories a day and it has to come from glucose. But we've known for over 50 years that the human brain can be perfectly satisfied, satisfied on beta-hydroxybutyrate. How do we know that? Well, there are people who eat almost no carbs in their diet for generations because there is none available to them, and they manage to make their way through life without you know, walking off of cliffs or doing something bad to themselves. The other thing we know is there was a research project done in Boston that was never published in the peer-reviewed literature because it wouldn't have been published for legal reasons. They took a group of people, adapted them to starvation for uh, somewhere between four and six weeks. Then they plugged an IV into them. So these people were in starvation ketosis with blood ketones of between four and seven millimolar. Okay. They plugged in an IV and they started slowly infusing insulin over the course of about eight hours. And by infusing insulin slowly into somebody who's got that level of ketosis, they drove their blood sugars down to levels of 25, 1.5 millimolar, at a level, a level at which, under any other circumstance, they would have been, been in coma or dead. And with ketones, they started at 7, they got down to, you know, the insulin suppresses ketones, but it doesn't work as fast as it does for glucose. Glucose went to coma-inducing levels, ketones stayed up, and the patient sat there in the, in, the, you know, in, the, in the metabolic ward and said, Doc, why are you sweating? The physician's looking at the numbers saying, this person being a come what the heck's going on? And the patient is completely asymptomatic because the brain is extremely happy to live on beta-hydroxybutyrate. So that was published as a book chapter, and I can send it to anybody if you're interested. I've got a PDF of it, uh, but it's very hard to find because... Imagine trying to get pat that past a human subjects review committee. <laughs> but I've got to plug an IV in and, and drive people's blood sugars to a level that should kill them and, and prove that, that, that it doesn't. So. <laughs> but something we, we, it was done, we need to know about it. So I would say that these are extremely knowledgeable people. This is a picture of three Inuit, one male, two females. This is taken about 1910. The person with the cam this is certainly the first camera they'd ever seen and probably the first European origin person they had seen. You can see that everything they're wearing is made in the animal product. There's no fabric here. The only metal they had was copper. Um, and um, they're walking on the tundra. In the summertime, the predominant vegetation there is lichens. Occasionally, you could, if you went far enough inland, you know, near the forest margins, you could find some berries. But the berry season, A, they were really sour, little lingon berries or frost berries. Um, uh, but that berry season might have been two months a year. These people lived for about four to five months on shore, on land, when the ice broke up. And then when the ocean froze up, they went out in the ocean and they hunted seals. In the springtime, when the ice broke, they would hunt whales. So if, you, if, you, if you killed a whale, you were in Fat City for a long time, literally. Um, but much of the, what they got over the course of the winter was from seals. So they lived on seal 
predominantly some whale in the spring into the summer, and then they kill fatted caribou in the fall as they finish their migration up to eat the lichen and headed back to the forest when they're fat, they killed them. And they, so they lived on this combination of food. They had almost no carbohydrate. They could walk overland for 50 miles, carrying all uh, per day. Of course, the days are long in the summer. They could walk for 50, 50 miles per day, carrying all their possessions you know, um, with them, the tremendous stamina, incredible strength. They lived a harsh life, um, but they were very, seemed to be very wise in what they um, uh, uh, captured and stored. And I think there's some wisdom in there that should be shared. So what did, uh, you know, you heard from Dr. Wortman about um, uh, emu fat in Australia. You learned about ulic in Greece from the Canadian Northwest. You heard about uh, pemmican. And these people independently used local materials to find ways to harvest and store fat. And you realize they took this itty, itty bit of ulican fish, you know, the, 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 the northwest people on the coast, they made this stuff called ulican grease. They would wait for the fish in the springtime. When the fish came in, they were prepared. They harvested them. They fermented them. They cooked them. They made these elegant bent wood boxes. A, a single box would hold 40, 40 pounds of this grease, put a top on it, and it could be carried in their canoes. It could be stored for year-round. It could be carried inland and traded. So a 40-pound load was a standard unit of, of ulican grease to trade for something else. And by the way, they made tons of this stuff each year. And this provided up to 50% of their total caloric intake year round. Uh, and so they learned how to process it and store it. And this is probably one of the first processed foods that, that, that non, other than, than polished rice. Uh, this is probably one of the first processed foods that humans invented. And it may have been, it could have been thousands of years ago. Uh, in the Arctic, the Inuit would, would uh, 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 harvest seal, they would take a seal skin, skin the seal without making any holes in it other than the ones they could tie off. They filled that skin full of seal blubber and then carry that for, for a month or two or three and use that as a source of both heat and light inside the igloo and also as a source of fuel for themselves. Um, herders who lived at uh, high altitude or at high latitudes uh, would make butter, cheese, and yogurt as a way of, of, of capturing and storing food and, and uh, carrying it. And the important point is that we think of the Paleolithic people as basically living hand to mouth. But I would say that we don't know what the Paleolithic people did. Maybe they had this t these technologies as well. But certainly modern hunters, hunters and herders found a way to, to harvest fat and to, to dry or, and store it and to dry protein. And if you have dried protein and stored fat, you can live on a pound to a pound and a half of that per day. It's a highly energy dense ration that allows you to, to live in between successful hunts. So you don't have to live hand to mouth. You can put enough in your storage, you know, even enough to carry with you that you can go considerable distances without having to go shopping, if you will. So you're freed from having to find fresh food every day. And t technologically, that's a very liberating um, so, uh, thing because it allows you to, to travel and it allows you to be selective in what you hunt. So I'm going to bore you with a couple pictures from my kitchen. So if I want pemmican, what do I do? I buy, f I make it from beef. I can't afford to buy buffalo. And when I do get buffalo, I'm not sure it's really buffalo. Yeah. Um, I cut the meat into thin slices. I don't know how clear this is, but it's on a drying rack. I save the fat. I cut away all the fat because when you dry it, you don't want the fat in with the meat. When it's dry, it looks like the stuff that Jay Wortman got when he was a kid. It's, it looks like a piece of leather. It's hard, dry. But this is not heat dried. This is air dried. It's not cooked. Um, and it has this fresh meat flavor, but it's really hard to chew. So you could spend two hours on that piece, right? So you take a mallet, you pound it on the board, and that piece there gets pounded out to look like this. And it basically breaks up the, the meat fibers, softens it up. Meanwhile, you take your fat, you put it in, I put it in my food processor, grind it, and then put it in a pan and heat it up and render it. I take the, the hammered meat, put it in a loaf pan, a heat pan, I heat the fat up to boiling temperature, pour the hot fat over the meat, then cover it and chill it, and I end up with a solid block. Now, I made a batch, and I put it, had it stored, I was going to bring it down here and say, this is what it looks like, plunk, and I forgot and left it home. <laughs> so next time out there, bring you something you can try. It's, it's a fascinating food because you eat a chunk of it, and, and you look, I mean, it's just fat and dried meat. It looks terrible. You put it in your mouth, and the fat, if you get it right, it melt, the fat melts in your mouth, and the meat is savory, and it's remarkably 
satisfying. Because a pound of this stuff is 2,800 calories. So a two pound pan like this, if I'm sedentary, not working hard, that's two, day, two days worth of food in that one pan. And I can put that in a backpack and carry it with me and eat it. Um, anyway, so if you want pemmican, I can give you, show you, I'll give, I can give you actually the recipe for it. So what, is, what happens when people eat pemmican? So these are two paintings made by a remarkable Philadelphia trained painter in the 1830s. His name was George Catlin. And Catlin, for whatever reason, in, around 1830 in Philadelphia, being a successful artist and painter, decided he was going to take his brushes and his canvases and his pencils and, his, and paper, and he was going to go west of the Mississippi River. In 1830, the last habitable, the farthest west habit, habitable um, um, city was St. Louis. Once you got past St. Louis, you were in the Indian Territory. And he went out there, and he met people who were still living their true Aboriginal lifestyle. They were not, they had, many of these groups had no trade with you know, the American East, if you will. Um, and he has, these are two pictures out of 250 of his paintings. These are two of them that are in the Smithsonian Institution. 250 or more of his, his uh, uh, pieces of artwork have survived and are preserved there. And these two guys, one is called Black Dog and one is Tali. They're Osage warriors. And he, as he pointed out, he wrote letters back. He had a wife, and for 10 years he was out there painting these people and sending his letters back to his wife in Philadelphia. And he described them as between six, and six feet, six inches, and seven feet tall. He's a, he's very, as a skilled artist, his proportions are right. But you look at the size of this guy's head versus his body, and you say, this is all wrong. But no, he has a normal size human head, and he has an abnormal length body. These are remarkably tall people. If you want confirmation of this, 30 years before, 25 years before this one, Lewis and Clark went up the Missouri River through Osage territory, and they interacted with the Osage people. They said, you need to go back to the east and meet the great white father, who was Thomas Jefferson. And so 14 of these guys packed themselves up, 14 Osage leaders went east to meet to Washington, and they met Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson wrote in a letter, this is documented, that they were the finest men we have ever seen, and they're gigantic. Jefferson was six feet two inches tall. He was one of the, he's said to be one of the tallest men in the colonies. He was one of the tallest white men in the colonies. But when you went west of the colonies, and you had people living on the buffalo, and there may have been some gathered food, but the gathered foods there were called women's food. The males typically did not eat gathered food. Why? I, you know, point of pride, uh, make, you know, whatever. You know, you could say, well, one tall person might be a freak, but if you have 14 of them in a group, you've got a pattern here. So when Dr. Wortman pointed out that, you know, the Aboriginal people in North America um, tended to be tall, I mean, this is well documented. So when people say, oh, yeah, but if you eat a, a, a hunter's diet, you, get, you know, there's not enough carbs, you don't stimulate insulin, you can't grow. Well, these guys didn't eat, there were no fields of waving grain. They did not eat carbs, and somehow they managed to grow really tall. Um, other evidence of interaction between early, you know, contact between um, uh, literate Europeans and Aboriginal people. Um, Dr. Wortman showed you a picture of Nootka, a Nootka fisherman spearing salmon with a multi-pronged spear. Uh, well, the Nootka people lived, lived at the southern end of uh, Vancouver Island. And in 1803, a, uh, a British trading ship the Boston, it was from Boston, England, not Boston, Massachusetts. The Boston um, sailed there to trade for sea otter pelts, which were highly valued in China. So they, were gonna, they sailed from England to there to, to get sea otter pelts, and they're going to go from there to, to China to trade for silk and porcelain. But they were attacked. The, the, the Nootka people had had a very bad interaction with a Spanish ship of, of like five years before, and they held a grudge. So when this next group of white guys came in with a sandwich ship, they acted really nice. And when their guard was down, they killed all but two people, one of whom was a gentleman aboard the ship whose name was John R. Jewett. And he was 20 years old. He was the blacksmith. And they'd seen this guy making things out of metal, and they figured, this is a valuable person, not because this is somebody we don't want to kill. So they kept him prisoner for two years. They 
had the ship which had lots of iron in it. And so they had, they, this guy, is a, his, he was making arrow points and spear points and fish hooks for them, a technology they strongly desired. They were smart enough to know this is a good guy to have around. And so they kept him and cared for him for two years as a prisoner of Nootka. And when another ship showed up offshore, he got into, they snuck into a canoe and paddled out and got away. And he came back and he wrote this book called The Prisoner of Nootka, which is an all-time bestseller in New England, because the ship he, he, he picked him up was a New England ship. It took him back to New England. And he actually toured the, the eastern United States uh, talking about his time looming among the aboriginal people. Um, it's interesting. He described their diet as mostly fish dipped in oil. He complained that there was no bread. There was nothing, no starches in their diet. Just fish and some terrestrial meats dipped in oil. And the oil he's talking about, of course, was wilkin grease. He said even the berries were served with oil. So when they did have berries, they mixed them with oil. So if, if you do the math on a bowl that's, you have a bowl with some berries in it and you put, you know, maybe half as much oil as berries, you're going to have 90% fat and at most 10% carbs, even for their condiment, which means they eat a very high fat, moderate protein, low carb diet. And the leader is, this is a di diagram, a, 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 the, he made their leader very famous because he was quite kind to this, because this guy took care of him, he just held him prisoner for two years. And this is um, a guy uh, whose name was um, uh, Makina, and Jewett, this was an average height European, described him as tall and powerfully built. So again, on this type of diet of meat and fat with relatively little carbs, you can, some people can be quite robust and quite, and quite strong. Uh, a modern picture here, that probably men can't see it very well. These are Maasai, modern Maasai. You can see their buildings down here in the valley. Uh, but some of these still, people still have very considerable height. In 1928, Two Brit British uh, guys, uh, Drs. Orr and Gilks, um, went and lived there for a year and studied the, um, the Maasai people who lived up in the hills, and they were nomadic herders. They didn't have permanent villages. They traveled around with their herds, looking, you know, finding the best forage and the best sources of water, etc. Whereas down in the valleys, there were a group of people called the Kikuyu, and the Kikuyu, Kikuyu were subsistence farmers and stayed in one place and lived from by agriculture, and Jed. Dr. Wortman and I have to get our slides right here because he said there were, Maasai were six inches tall or five inches, and I say there were six, so we'll have to fight that out. Uh, but Orrin Guild said they were tall, leaner, and had less tooth decay. And what they really said was the uh, Kikuyu people, people tended to be kind of heavy in the waist, whereas the uh, Maasai were broad in the chest and narrow in the waist. So you already get a sense of. People living in the same region, living lifestyles they'd lived for probably a thousand years, completely separate cultures. One was tall and narrow-waisted, and one, e even though they're living by the sweat of their brow as subsistence farmers, were developing some of the early signs of metabolic syndrome. Okay. And this was documented in a r remarkable 60-page report that was published uh, in 1931. And that was 50 years after the Messiah had had contact with the Europeans. They could have changed their diet, but they chose not to. And particularly among the Maasai warrior class, who were the ones, they weren't fighting wars. What, what, was, their, what was the warrior class job? They had, you know, any, any family had hundreds of head of cows and sheep, and they lived in an area where there were lions and tigers. So what was the warrior class job? Is to defend the herds. These are the people with spears who killed lions by hand with a spear to protect their, their cattle. So anyway. Okay, let's, so those are things that we have documented. And then we have some other remarkable sagas of, of the Europeans who lived among the Aboriginal people. This guy, John Ray, I, I would call him Dr. John Ray, but he, if he was alive, he would have punched me if I said so, because he was trained in the British tradition as a surgeon. As British surgeons are not called doctor, they're called mister. Remember that. Um, anyway, um, this guy, uh, after he graduated from, from uh, his surgical training in Edinburgh, in Scotland. He went to work for the Hudson Bay Company in, in northern Canada. He lived there from 1832 to 1855. And he had this passion for exploring, moving the, comp the Hudson Bay Company's um, territory further and further north. And if you look at this picture, this little map over here, this is northern Canada. This is the Boothia Peninsula. He single-handedly charted pretty much this whole peninsula. And then he went west off this and to over to Victoria Island and charted. He charted, of the coastline of the Northwest Passage, he charted 1,500 miles. That means he walked it. He did astronomical observations with a sextant to find his 
you know, his position, and he made the maps that accurately depicted more of the Northwest Passage coastline than any other explorer. But unlike most of the explorers of the time, he didn't go out on big expeditions with all his food. He would go out with his sextant, he would have a gun, and uh, he would travel with the Aboriginal people, either the uh, pure, Abor you know, pure First Nations and Inuit or mixed race Métis, uh, and he let, he preferred them as uh, companions. He ate their diet, he built igloos, and he traveled light, which means he could go out and he would spend up to a year of time out exploring, not having to carry almost all of his food. Um, at one time, and, but when he did use stored provisions, what he preferred was pemmican, and he wrote in his, in his diary the 133 day stretch of heavy travel where he was going with two companions and, to get, and they consumed about two pounds per person of pemmican as their predominant source of energy. They're carrying their, their, their gear or pulling it with, behind them on sleds and this, this, the diet composition was between 75 and 80 percent fat. And this guy is learning from the wisdom of people who lived there for 3,000 years. So I see him as a transducer of aboriginal research, if you will, onto what's right in terms of foods in that environment for that purpose. The other criticism of this diet, of course, is he, you know, he's not eating any plant food, particularly if he's traveling in the winter because there ain't no plants to eat. And they didn't have vitamin C pills, right? And people say, well, you know, if you don't eat vitamin C for, for four months, you're going to get scurvy. Now, the British naval surgeons, um, Lind, defined scurvy in what? When was it, 1800 or something? 17, he did the experiment with, with uh, uh, lemons and limes and, and, and stopped scurvy. But um, this guy would know what scurvy was because he trained in Edinburgh. And he would go, could go for a whole year living on this aboriginal diet without plant, and certainly no fruits, and he'd never develop signs of scurvy, which is still a head-scratcher. Until you realize that vitamin C helps protect the body against oxidative stress. What does beta-hydroxybutyrate do? We'll have you write that down later. I don't want to get too far, but there are a lot of these stories. This is a guy named, this guy here is Frederick Swatka. He went into the Arctic with one, two, there were actually four of them who went into the Arctic. They wanted to find what happened to a Royal Navy expedition of two ships and 129 men that went looking for the Northwest Passage. Ray had found relics from that expedition and talked to the Inuit people who said the ships got trapped in the ice and the guys all died within two years of the ships being trapped in the ice. Um, and we don't know whether they died of food poisoning or scurvy, but they died trying, eating their stored provisions in their ships while the Aboriginal people around them were living hale and hearty lives. But a completely different culture that the British um, naval tradition would not allow them to embrace, or would not let them embrace it. Okay? So these guys wanted to find the logbooks of the ships, so they wanted to travel from the west coast of Hudson's Bay, 1,500 miles across to where Ray had discovered the ships had gone down and tried to find the logbooks. So they recruited two Inuit families. You can see, here are the Inuits talking. These guys are taking notes. I like that. They're listening. And they recruited the Inuit families, and they had the Inuits uh, transport them and hunt for them and feed them, and they ate the Inuit diet. And you can see they're already half under the Inuit clothing. They still got their, English, or their European coats, fabric coats, but they're wearing the the skin leggings and the seal skin boots. They're halfway there in the transition. And they haven't even started out their trip yet. He made a truly fascinating observation, and one that really disappointed me because I thought I made it 100 years later. And that's the process of keto adaptation. He defined it in 1880, and I defended my dissertation in 1980 in which I, I defined keto adaptation. And then I read this guy's <laughs> story and realized I've been scooped by 100 years. This is fascinating because he's. He said, when thrown wholly upon the diet of the of reindeer meat, by which he means caribou, it seems inadequate to properly nourish the system, and there is an apparent weakness and inability to perform fatiguing journeys. But this soon passes away in the course of two to three weeks. That when you first give up your carbs, there's a transition phase where you feel lousy. And when you look at the concept of carbohydrate loading that was developed by the Scandinavians starting in 
in uh, 1939, and then by the, you know, then re, uh, after World War II, it was picked up again and really well defined by the Swedes in 1964 to 1968. They did studies of one to two week duration where they put people on a high carb diet compared to a low carb diet, and performance went to hell in a handbasket in the first week or two. And they said, see, you need carbs to function. But they never did a study beyond two weeks. And Swatka said, after two, two to three weeks, your body adapts and you can live on a diet that's mostly fat. Um, he published this diary and it was uh, basically lost because it gave a message that people didn't want to believe. And then it, it, was, it was discovered in a trunk and published by the Marine Historical Society in Mystic, Connecticut in 1965. My parents happened to be members of the Historical Society, so they were sent a copy of this thing. And I, in 1979, 1980, I discovered it on their bookshelf. I opened it up and said, wow, <laughs> look at this. I mean, this, so this guy lived among these people and reported something that was essentially unknown and was unappreciated when he reported it. And the final one I want to talk about is a guy named Wilhelmir Stefansson. As you might guess, his, he's of Nordic, actually Icelandic parentage. He was born in Canada, trained in University of North Dakota, and then went to Harvard to do graduate stu studies in anthropology. And he was really fascinated by the Inuit people. So he left Harvard in 1905, and between 05 and 17, spent 10 of those 12 years living among the Inuit. He learned their language. He learned to, they taught him how to hunt. They, he learned how to make igloos. So he did basically what um, uh, John Ray had done. And he traveled farther into the Arctic than any European had before. And he was sometimes gone from any contact you know, uh, with the outside world for two years. His um, uh, obituary was published in the New York Times. <laughs> Nobody's seen him for two years. And then he came walking back out. And he said, I had to come back because I was almost out of ammunition. And I'm down to 10 rounds in my rifle, which means I'm going to run short of food soon. Um, and he wrote a number of books and papers. And he said, you know, I could live on the diet of the native for up to two years at a time with no fruits and vegetables, and I never got sick. Well, in between 1914 and 1926, all of the, what we call the vitamins, were discovered. And most of them were found in, many of them were found only in fruits and vegetables, including ascorbate, or you know, vitamin C. And he was so vilified by the press the lay press and his professional press, that in order to salvage his reputation, he allowed himself to be locked up in Bellevue Hospital in New York City and put on a diet that he, of, of macronutrients like what he said he got in the Arctic. They didn't, have, of course, have whale and seal. Uh, but he lived on a diet of meat and fat under observation, continuous 24-hour observation for the first four months because they knew he would develop scurvy within four months. And he didn't. And by the way, he brought along another of his companion explorers. So they had two, at the end of two, they were kept under on this diet and under observation, um, not continuously after four months, but for a full year. And for that full year, he remained healthy and functional. Uh, and they said, when he went, when they took him out to Central Park for exercise, they wanted to keep an eye on him. So they sent an attendant along with him, and he would outrun his attendant, which, <laughs> which means he wasn't debilitated by this diet. So he actually had to defend himself and his reputation by being a you know, end of two subject that, that proved that you could get by on this diet and not get sick. The beautiful thing about this is they charted precisely what he ate. So now we have macronutrient composition from a guy who was trained by an Inuit culture that he honored that went back 3,000 years. And what did he eat? He ate meat, fish, poultry. If it was boiled, he drank the broth. There were brains, bone marrow, liver, and kidney. So he ate organ meats as well as, you know, lean meat. Um, and he always chose the fattier meats. And when you look at the macronutrient composition, he was 115 grams per day of protein. This is not a high protein diet. 115 grams of protein per day, over 200 grams of fat. And the only carbohydrates he got was the glycogen that was in the meat when the animals killed which would, were estimated as less than 10 grams per day. So he's over 80% fat, 15 to 20, maximum 20% protein. So this is not a high protein. This is a moderate protein, high fat diet that maintained well-being and function and meant that, among other things, we presume that maybe the beta-hydroxybutyrate and its effect on gene, the gene quieting, you know, suppressing those gene quieting uh, enzymes allowed him not to get scurvy.
So maybe scurvy is only a disease of carbohydrate eaters. Who knows? So to end up, I want to mention that um, I decided to use the Stefanson diet and do a study with an N of, we actually had an N of nine, but five of our, our subjects were lean bicycle race, highly trained bicycle racers. And we had them on a, the ketogenic diet for four weeks, so we gave them an ad, that, you know, four weeks of time to adapt, so more than the two that, two to three that Swapka said was required. And we had our diet composed similar to what Stefanson, um, uh, was reported for what Stefanson ate under observation. And I don't want to bore you with too much data, but I'll point out a couple things. We measured their peak aerobic power. This is the maximum rate at which the body can consume oxygen during exercise for these guys riding on a stationary bike. Their baseline oxygen consumption was five liters per minute. Now, a liter, one liter of oxygen consumption is, represents about five calories burned. So if you translate this into calories per hour, this is 1,500 calories per hour at their peak. And that's a huge output. These are highly trained, remarkably capable cyclists. Four weeks into the ketogenic diet, their number was 5.0. These are not statistically significant. Statistically, these are identical numbers. So four weeks without carbs, and they still had that remarkable high level of peak aerobic power. When we had them ex exercise, it's 65% of that, which is a little over three liters per hour, over 900 calories per, uh, sorry, three liters per minute, 900 calories per hour. Their duration in minutes to exhaustion on the bike was 147 minutes. After four weeks, it was 151. These are, again, statistically identical numbers, which means their ability to do endurance exercise after four weeks was completely unimpaired, impaired by taking away their carbs. And by the way, when they're exercising at this rate, you think, boy, they're using a lot of glucose. But if they became hypoglycemic, it didn't seem to affect their well-being because they didn't say, I feel terrible, I'm going to quit. They were able to go the same duration. The most and we actually stuck needles in their muscle and took out muscle and looked at glycogen content. And we can measure change in glycogen. So don't worry about the units. The number here was 87 when they did this, this duration of, of exercise uh, at the 65% at the, the power. So they used 87 units of glycogen in the mus from the muscle. After they'd adapted for just four weeks, they cut that down to 23. So they reduced their glycogen dependence by a factor of three, more than a factor of three and did the same work. So this whole idea that you have to have glycogen to do vigorous activity is only true when you limit yourself to a non-ketogenic, or you know, for a, you know, so we're talking about the difference between a moderate carb and high carb. But when you're in the low carb, you're in a completely different world. You've fallen down Alice's, Alice in Wonderland's rabbit hole and the world's upside down. The other thing I'll mention is, I, I talked about this before in terms of inflammation. They had a low, white, not dangerously low, they had a low normal white blood cell count, and it went even lower, still normal, which implied that even for people with almost no inflammation, they still had an anti-inflammatory effect by making this transition. So imagine if you have people with metabolic syndrome who have a high level of inflammation, how much of a drop, and we've seen that in the studies with Dr. Wartman's group. So, um, I, I, I would like to get across the idea that first, there's really no human requirement for carbohydrate coming from the diet. Yes, there's a requirement for blood sugar, but you can eat a diet that's 15 or 20 percent protein uh, and maintain normal health and function where almost all the rest of your calories come from fat. Um, if you have if you eat carbohydrate in doses that don't suppress nutritional ketosis, that becomes an optional part, optional part of your diet. So, you know, when we talk about eating berries and, and uh, you know, avocado, and I, I have a passion for heirloom tomatoes. I grow a lot of them. I only can eat four ounces of them a day. I love that four ounces. Uh, so that's an option because I can tolerate that. But my tolerance is probably twice what Dr. Wortman's is because I'm not as, quite as close to, to type 2 diabetes as he is. Uh, you know, genetically. Um, but again, there's no requirement for that carbohydrate, so the carbohydrates become optional. Um, so when you do the math, if you eat 15 to 20 percent protein, you eat uh, five, at most 5 percent as carbs. That means if you're going to meet your daily energy needs and stay weight stable over time, you've got to eat a high fat diet. The number here is 75 percent. My number personally is about 80 percent. And I've done that for 
uh, 10 of the last 11 years. I won't bore you with why I took a year off, but it really convinced me that I needed to be on, not off. And with that, I'll end. And again, thanks for your attention, and I'll try to answer questions if you have them.